Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. We know the Bible can be hard to understand and complicated to sort out all the different uh, issues and questions that you may have as you're reading it for yourself and trying to interpret it. So what we're wanting to do in this series is just to provide some background information, some context, and some helpful resources for you to interpret the Bible. So here's what we want you to know before you read. Joel is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, part of the group of prophetic books called the Twelve in the Hebrew Bible. Now, as with all the minor prophets, the book is minor only in its size, either three or four chapters, depending on how you divide it. Uh, calling it minor says nothing about the importance of its message. The book of Joel has defied consistent interpretation and understanding. There are multiple perspectives on just about every aspect of this book. Now, while you could say that about most biblical issues, with Joel it seems there are equally plausible interpretations that are quite different from other equally plausible interpretations. Even the question of how to divide the book into chapters and verses is debated. Now, this is not to say that every interpretation out there is equally valid, only that there are multiple valid ways of reading this book. Uh, today we're going to try and highlight a few of the least controversial items, but also to give some background that we think is at play in this book. The book itself can be roughly divided into three sections. The first is a poetic description of a locust plague. It's addressed to the elders and the people of Judah, and it ends with a call to fasting and temple prayer. Now, the second section is a warning of the coming of the day of the Lord, which also ends with a call to fasting and temple prayer. The final section is the Lord's answer to these warnings and the responses of the people, which includes removing the locusts, judging the nations around Judah, and blessing God's people. Now, part of the reason that this book resists easy interpretation is because the disasters described in it could be referring to a specific disaster, or they could be describing multiple kinds of disasters. It could be describing a particular plague of locusts, or it could be describing every agricultural calamity that could come to Judah. It could also be using the language of locusts metaphorically to describe a foreign army, either a specific military campaign or a foreign military intervention in general. The book draws on and develops the ideas of the day of the Lord and the importance of Zion, that is, the temple in Jerusalem. These ideas were circulating in Israel for centuries, and the author of Joel picks up these ideas here. The book starts with the phrase, the word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Pethuel. Now this is the only explicit information we have about authorship from the book itself. The name Joel means Yah or Yahweh is God. His father's name is Pethuel, which means a youth of El or a youth belonging to El. The lack of further identification may mean that Joel was well known to his audience and that further identification was unnecessary. Some scholars have suggested that Joel was a temple prophet meaning he worked at the temple in Jerusalem, and that his work preserved in this book pertains to his work in the temple. Now, this is a controversial interpretation, though, because scholars are not settled on the role and the function of prophets in relation to the temple. It's not obvious that the temple had a stable position of temple prophet, since prophets tended to be connected with the court and the kings rather than with the temple. Now, with that said, it seems likely that given the importance of the temple in this book, Joel was in some way associated with the temple, and that he had some kind of prophetic ministry there, even if it wasn't in an official capacity. As with most aspects of this book, it isn't clear when the book was written. Now, some scholars see it as later, and others see it as earlier. There is evidence to support both interpretations, and where you date it depends on which evidence you think is more significant. We'll look at linguistic evidence, canonical placement, and textual clues, and how different scholars interpret them. First, the linguistic evidence. Some scholars have suggested that some of the vocabulary in the book of Joel are what are called Aramaisms, or Hebrew words borrowed from the Aramaic language. These are usually a marker of later Hebrew, in the 6th century or later. However, other scholars have reviewed these and don't see the propo proposed Aramaisms as being necessarily Aramaisms. Instead, they think these words could actually reflect older language. 
Others have looked at how the text is placed in the biblical canon to determine the date of Joel's composition. In the Masoretic textual tradition, Joel appears after Hosea and before Amos, who were both 8th century prophets. Now, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, places Joel between Micah and Obadiah, who are certainly later than the 8th century. The Septuagint tradition is generally an older tradition than the Masoretic tradition, but it deals with a translation of the Hebrew Bible, while the Masoretic tradition is based on the original Hebrew. Still others have looked at textual clues in the book to try and find a fitting composition time frame. A major focus of this textual evidence is the locust plague in chapter 2. Now, the book may seem to date to immediately after a plague of locusts has presumably come to Judah, but that may not be very helpful evidence. Such events were not entirely uncommon, so linking the composition of Joel to just one locust plague event could be difficult. On the other hand, the commonality of these events may actually be an important element in understanding the nature of the book of Joel, which we'll get to in a moment. The book frequently addresses the elders of Judah. Now, some take this to indicate the absence of a king, such as when Adaliah had regency over Judah in the 9th century. If this is the composition period of Joel, it would make Joel one of the earliest pro prophetic works. But this is not likely. Another interpretation is that Joel reflects a post-exilic date when there was no king. However, the elders were an important social institution in Israel, even when there was a king. So the fact that Joel addresses this group may not be as significant as some think. There are limited references to Israel, and most of the references are to Judah, which may point to a date after the 720s when the northern kingdom had been destroyed. There are also references to a temple, which may point to some time before the first temple was destroyed in 586, or after the second temple was completed in 515. The end of the book refers to the polities of Tyre, Sidon, the Philistines, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Sabaeans. These are all traditional enemies of Israel. Even Greeks were known in Israel from as early as the 8th century from both Assyrian sources and from sites like Metzad Hashavyahu, where Greek mercenaries were believed to be stationed during the time of King Josiah. The lack of reference to either Assyria or Babylon is somewhat odd given that those were the major antagonists of Israel and Judah and their prophets. Finally, Joel alludes to several other prophetic works, but exploring these references doesn't make dating the book entirely clear. It leads down a rather circular road where Joel is either quoting existing prophets, including 6th century prophets like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other solidly post-exilic prophets, or the later prophets are familiar with Joel. Now, Some think there was even a lost, shared prophetic tradition, which makes it really difficult to know who is quoting whom. Is Joel quoting other prophetic works, or are they all quoting a common source that we don't have? Or are the other prophets referencing Joel? Given all this conflicting evidence, it's not surprising that there's no consensus on when Joel was written. Based on the linguistic evidence, some of the textual clues, and an emphasis on proper religious activity, a date that is either late pre-exilic or early post-exilic seems most likely. This would make Joel a near contemporary with Haggai and Zechariah, who also share Joel's concerns about proper ritual activity. Because this text defies easy interpretation, there are a lot of background and contextual clues that may be relevant for understanding Joel. One option that seems most likely to us is that Joel was a liturgical text used at the temple, and it can be interpreted in light of that. The vagueness in describing some of the calamities in the text make them useful for a lot of different kinds of crises. The first section was likely used in times of agricultural crisis, which could include a locust plague, but also more general things like drought and other crop failures. The use of this as a liturgical text in the temple would mean it would be used over a long period of time and applied to a lot of different crises. The remedy for the crisis, fasting and a call to repentance, can be used at any time as well. Now, this would mean that Joel is not calling out a specific sin needing confession and repentance, but simply that there is sin which needs repentance. Now, if Joel is a liturgical text, it may actually have been used as a kind of ritual for restoring the land and its people to blessing. Scholars have rightly noted that a lot of language in Joel is associated with Israel's understanding of cosmic order and disharmony. 
The Israelites had their own understanding and vocabulary around the ordering of the cosmos and the threat of chaos, which can sometimes be hard to catch if you don't know what you're looking for. Now, this language is certainly here in Joel. Joel 2.23 gives perhaps the best indication of this. Many translations will read something like, Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. But the last phrase could have a different translation. Uh, the word for rain used here also appears in the next phrase, and there it almost certainly means rain. But in this context, it can also mean something like teacher, or even oracle giver, or leader. And the word translated faithful is tzedakah, which is a word recognized as one way that Israel communicated its sense of cosmic order. So it could be translated, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you teachers to bring right order, or something to that effect. This is then followed by signs of proper order, the rain coming and the fields producing crops. So what we see in Joel is that Israel's sense of cosmic harmony and order has been harmed and thrown out of balance. The plague and suffering described in chapters 1 and 2 are a consequence of this disordering event. What's needed is a return to the right order. But God has given them teachers to help them restore this right order. Some scholars have interpreted this right order in Joel as a return to proper temple worship and ritual, which would make sense if Joel was utilized as a temple text. Now, this uh, theme of chaos and order in ancient Israel is going to be a big focus for us in Season 3 coming up this fall. So if you want to learn more about that, be sure to like and subscribe today. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.